a great pleasure to welcome all of you to what I know is going to be a fantastic uh, workshop. Uh, my role is very brief, you'll be uh, pleased to learn, uh, and it is simply to set out uh, the objectives for this workshop, which are essentially to learn from a number of uh, perspectives uh, about what works in terms of social enterprise in Africa, uh, based on people's real-life experiences, uh, and how we can translate experience in social enterprise in Africa into learnings for Canada and vice versa. Of course, there are many, many links between uh, Canada and uh, Africa, and uh, those are institutional links, government-to-government uh, -government links, uh, but certainly many, many of our post-secondary institutions in Canada do have very active research in Africa and collaborative uh, academic programming in Africa. So this is all about what works, uh, what uh, we can learn from, and how we can share uh, perspectives. So I know we're going to have uh, an amazing conversation, uh, and it is my great pleasure therefore to introduce uh, our moderator, uh, who is Kayla Hounsell. Uh, Kayla will be very well known to everyone as a lead reporter and presenter for CD CTV, uh, also uh, an occasional anchor for CTV, but I, I know from having spoken to Kayla that she prefers to be out on the road getting those stories. And uh, we were talking earlier today about uh, uh, her experience covering the uh, Air Canada crash uh, at Halifax Airport a few weeks ago. So that's the kind of work that Kayla likes to do. What may be less well known to people, but very well known to uh, us on the panel and, and probably some in the uh, audience, is that uh, Kayla also has a passion for human rights and journalism. And that passion uh, took her to Rwanda in 2006 when she was a student of journalism at Carlton. And more recently, it took her to South Sudan where she spent uh, four weeks uh, training uh, journalists in that very, very troubled country. Uh, and uh, that was when we discovered uh, what an amazing asset we have in Atlantic Canada and in Canada in Kayla as someone who not only is a great journalist but has a heart and is able to transfer her passion, her knowledge about her craft, her profession uh, into some fairly difficult parts of the world. So uh, it's an interesting story of connections this because um, I was struck when, when Michael Lewis was showing his picture of northern China and that degraded environment and, and how uh, that degraded environment was transformed through people uh, and through investments in the environment to completely transform that uh, situation. It reminded me of, of um, work I did in Darfur in the uh, 1980s, which is many, many years ago. I know I don't look that old, but um, I was working in, in uh, international development in the 80s and spent a lot of time in uh, Darfur. And it was that experience that, that really taught me about resilience because if there's one place on the planet that demonstrates resilience in the face of adversity it's Darfur uh, and of course many other parts of sub-Saharan Africa are like that many other parts of the world uh, are like that but I certainly learned that uh, lesson uh, where people with almost nothing apparently still make it through are still entrepreneurial uh, they're still uh, making things work for their families and for their society so it was that link to Darfur that meant that I dragged Kevin uh, over to Juba a couple of years ago because uh, I'd always retained links in Sudan and now in South Sudan. Uh, and of course it was uh, that, uh, that uh, two days we spent in, in Juba that allowed Kevin to take off and do all kinds of connecting and develop all kinds of brilliant ideas which now means that CBU is in South Sudan. And it also means now that we're talking to Kayla about her work in South Sudan. So it's funny how the world works, really, and, and, and how these connections get made. But it's all about values. It's all about seeing the world and seeing humanity the same way. So I think we could be no better served today than having uh, a moderator as, as passionate about our, her profession, 
and about the world of human rights and, and Africa as uh, Kayla Hounslow. So please join with me in welcoming Kayla Hounslow, our moderator. Dr. Wheeler for the kind introduction and good morning everyone. It's great to be here with you. It's a beautiful morning in Sydney so we're happy that you're here inside with us. I know you won't regret it. We have an incredible panel of people put together here. They're doing some fantastic work on social enterprises in Africa and we're going to hear from each of them about their work in just a few minutes. We'll also hopefully have some time at the end to take some of your questions. But I've been asked first just to tell you a little bit about my work so that you know where I'm coming from. So. As Dr. Wheeler mentioned, I first went to Africa in 2006. I believe it's been nine years since then when I was a student at Carleton University. And that was a program called the Rwanda Initiative, which sadly no longer exists. But it was a partnership between Carleton and the National University of Rwanda. So I lived in Butari, which is Rwanda's second largest center, for two months. And together with a Canadian journalism professor, we taught a television course to students, many of whom had never seen cameras, let alone ever use them. They were using pens and paper, and really the program aimed to foster a professional media in Rwanda. So when I ask most people what they know about Rwanda, they can likely sum it up in one word, genocide, right? It's all we ever hear about. Of course, Rwanda is so much more than that. It's a beautiful country with beautiful people, but here we are 21 years later, and much of the country, its people, and its industries are indeed shaped by genocide. So the media was in part blamed for the genocide, the international media for effectively missing the story and failing to inform the international community about the atrocities that were taking place there in 1994, but also the local media for inciting hate and as a result, the media as an industry, like many industries, really was decimated and there are few professional journalists there. That is changing and I can tell you that the student journalists that we worked with in 2006 desperately wanted to be professional. They wanted to be ethical and they have a razor sharp understanding of the responsibility that it is to be a journalist. And they genuinely believe that their stories can change the course of their country and change the world. So that was incredibly inspiring to me as a young journalist, still a student journalist at that time, to understand that. And I believe that it really has shaped the kind of journalist that I've become over the past almost decade now. So you've probably heard before that uh, people who visit Africa fall in love. and. Uh, have an appreciation and you're just drawn and want to go back. So that was certainly the case for me. So recently when CTV, the organization that I now work with, partnered with an organization called Journalists for Human Rights, I jumped at the chance to go back. So I'll tell you a little bit about JHR. It is a media development organization. It's based in Toronto and its mission is to empower journalists to tell human rights stories effectively and objectively. So far, they've trained 13,000 journalists in 22 of the world's most challenging places. And that's because we believe that during a conflict or immediately after a conflict is the best time to intervene to do this kind of work. And that's because, really, that's when the media can have the most significant impact to highlight human rights issues and often to inform people of what their rights are. So that's why I went to South Sudan for a month just this past January. JHR works in a couple of different ways. Um, so I was embedded at a local television station. So I worked with the local journalist in South Sudan. I went where they went. I covered the stories that they covered. And I was astounded to learn that often what they considered a story was to show up to a government press conference, record whatever the minister of the day happened to be announcing, and then simply put that on the news. They rarely, if ever, took those stories to the streets to interview what I like to call the real people, the people who are actually impacted by those stories. And sometimes that was because of resources, and we all struggle with that. Um, but often it was because they couldn't. It was simply too dangerous. And it's interesting that you'll hear in South Sudan many politicians, and I did hear them myself in the month that I was there, talk about the free press that they enjoy. And I heard one minister say that uh, our journalists are free, they're just not completely free. 
And so I would argue if you're not completely free, then you're not free at all. And I can tell you that a lot of what I uh, saw there, they do not enjoy a free press. But part of my work was also to do workshops uh, on a, many, many different aspects of journalism. So as I conducted workshops on how to write for broadcast and understanding bias and conflict of interest, it became very clear to me that the South Sudanese journalists wanted to tell those kind of stories. They just didn't necessarily always have the tools to do that. So they started pitching ideas to me, human rights ideas, ideas of stories of how to cover human rights. And they wanted to do them and they were asking for my help. And we had some tremendous examples of success while I was there and it was great to see that. But it's important to know that it wasn't easy and they weren't all success stories. There were some stories that journalists wanted to do and they were all ideas generated by the South Sudanese journalists. And we didn't get to do them. And sometimes it was simply because it was just too dangerous to do it. And that's really a shame. And I'm saddened to say that since my return, the situation in South Sudan is worsening. Um, as you may know, South Sudan is in the midst of a brutal civil war. Uh, today, actually, somewhat ironically, marks the fourth, in, fourth anniversary of the independence of South Sudan from the Sudan. Uh, so on this day, four years ago, that country was filled with so much hope and optimism, and it's hard to believe that now the situation is worsening, the fighting is intensifying, the number of people without access to food is also escalating. So you might be asking yourself, why does it matter then? Why does it matter if journalists enjoy a free press, if people are being gang raped and killed and children are starving? Why does it matter if they can tell the kind of stories that they want to tell, but it does matter, and here is why. They as journalists are not advocates, but it's so important that they are able to tell the stories to people about what's happening around them so that they can become advocates for themselves. JHR believes wholeheartedly in sustainability, and the JHR project in South Sudan very much is sustainable. On that note, before I turn things over to my friends here, I want to share with you the words of our Canadian ambassador in South Sudan, Nicholas Coughlin. While I was in Juba, he said to me about the work that we were doing and about a free press, the work that JHR is doing is a really important area of activity these days. For South Sudanese to be able to properly take control of their country, of their very young country, as they hope they will, they need to develop the ability to communicate with their government, to hold their government accountable. A vibrant and free media are absolutely critical in that regard. There is no more important activity that can be undertaken. So that was what Nicholas Coughlin said about a free press. I hope you can think about that as you hear some of the stories of the work that our panelists are doing. There are many important activities that are taking place in different parts of Africa, and I'm so pleased that you're all sharing your experiences with us today. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first panelist, which is Dr. Kevin McCagg, a familiar face here at CBU to my immediate left. He is an assistant professor of social entrepreneurship at CBU and an internationally experienced academic and researcher of community-based and enterprise-led approaches to global poverty alleviation. Kevin has an MBA and a PhD from the Schulich School of Business in Toronto focusing on sustainable enterprise and a Bachelor of Arts in Science from McMaster University focusing on international development. Over the last 20 years, Kevin has worked in 12 African countries, India and Bangladesh, including leading major research projects for the United Nations Development Program, the World Bank and the International Development Research Center. Please welcome Dr. Kevin McKay. Thank you very much, Kayla. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being at this session today. Thanks to George for organizing this whole uh, entire fantastic uh, conference. Thanks to some of my students uh, who are here today getting a break from uh, class. So, uh, so thanks to everyone. It's great to hear uh, your introductory re remarks, Kayla. And it's obvious the role that um, Journalists for Human Rights plays in South Sudan. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking about what is the story, what is our story as Cape Breton University or a Canadian university in South Sudan. And I think there is a very important role for uh, a research-oriented university, and that's kind of part of the story that I'd like to talk about today. I think there's also um, a story about how, um, you know, we in this part of Canada, this part of the world are um, familiar with 
uh, challenging social and, and economic circumstances. Certainly, it's a, it's a different order of magnitude um, than one would experience in, in South Sudan currently. But there's this sense of um, we, we, can, uh, we, we have challenges, but how can they be kind of creatively addressed by working with the resources and the creativity of local people? And I think that is certainly a theme that we see very much in, in the work that we're doing in South Sudan with our partners there. So I think um, th there's, there's a fitting kind of story about um, creatively working with local people, overcoming difficult situations, and f trying to find solutions that work. That it's, it's familiar to us, I think, I think here, and um, certainly it's uh, something that um, our partners are facing every day and uh, in even more challenging circumstances. So um, we, uh, we at CBU, uh, together with um, uh, Sheila Prophet, is here with us today at the, um, uh, in the nursing school here. We have a uh, Canada Research Chair, Ashley Consolo Willox, um, and a number of other faculty members are involved in this uh, research in South Sudan. Um, so it's, it's partly a story of this kind of connections that David has worked in Africa for decades. I've worked there uh, for a number of years. And um, we, we came to South Sudan. There was this incredible optimism, as, as Kayla talked about four years ago, a newly independent country, um, and uh, a lot of hope and optimism. Unfortunately, things have turned for the worst with the, the conflict there, the civil war, uh, with, with no current end in sight. So I think you know, w one of the question is, in, in this kind of very challenging context, what is the role that an institution like ours can play, like, like a, a Canadian university, and particularly CBU. So I think that um, th there's a few things, you know, as, as we've gone through this work in this challenging context. One is, um, you know, searching for, uh, for opportunities to contribute in some very concrete and practical way. So not to do kind of go and, and, and collect data and, and publish research that might not have any practical application. Making sure that whatever research and whatever knowledge that we're generating is responding to the real needs of our partners and, and people on the ground. So I think that is, and searching for the right opportunities where we can have a fit and make a contribution. The next important thing that I think we've learned is working with good partners. And I'm talking with Kayla, it sounds like you know, the journalists and her local partners are journalists and human rights an excellent example of that. And, and we've also been fortunate, we, we've searched around for local partners and we have some um, uh, great partners deeply uh, rooted in the context there, um, doing some very good work. So this is not a case of us going kind of blindly and, and doing something all by ourselves. We have a very deep and very strong uh, local partnerships with, um, with South Sudanese based organizations. And then finally, you know, how can you tell the story about what you're doing? And again, as a researcher and academic, you know, we do a PhD, we get trained to write in academic journals and, and there's a role for that and there's, you know, there's an importance in, in creating knowledge and having that publicly available. But how can we go beyond that and how can we engage people um, with, with uh, videos and images and stories to try to connect us a little bit closer um, to what's happening there and to, and to motivate and engage people. So um, just to talk very briefly about each of these three points, the one opportunity that we saw in South Sudan was working with local community health workers. This goes back to what are the resources that are on the ground? They're individuals in villages and communities. They, uh, they are living there and they become trained in basic primary health care and they then go door to door to um, uh, check on women with children, check on pregnant mothers, um, uh, check if there's uh, instances of malaria or, or TB uh, or what have you and, ba and deliver basic um, prevention and treatment and health care messages. So this was one of the important opportunities that we saw where we could maybe together with the Faculty of Nursing and the Business School um, uh, make a, um, uh, a contribution. The context uh, in South Sudan is that there's very limited human resources and very limited financial resources. There's only 
less than 200 doctors, less than 2,000 nurses in a country of 10 million people. Um, so these local community health workers become even more important resource in that uh, context. So what was the partner that we worked with? This was a non-governmental organization called BRAC. They are the largest non-governmental organization in the world. They have 100,000 employees. They touch over 100 million people every year with their programs. They started in Bangladesh. They're now in uh, over 10 countries, 11 countries. And interestingly, 80% of their own budget to fund all of the development work that they do comes from their own social enterprise activities. They run businesses that, that meet a need that is in the marketplace, and the, the income generated from that funds uh, social programs like the healthcare work uh, that's done in South Sudan. So our research, um, we were you know, building off the initial visit that David and I had in, in Juba. We were successful in getting Grand Challenges funding to do some pilot projects and deepen our relationships in South Sudan. And then more recently, we've been successful working with uh, IDRC um, for um, a million dollars in funding. This will be a major five-year multi-country uh, randomized control trial research to really look at what are the best ways that community health workers can generate income and uh, receive some type of financial or non-financial in incentives to reduce uh, maternal and child mortality. So this, the answers to this question will be relevant not only in South Sudan but throughout Africa where these types of health work programs, health worker programs are um, being delivered. So, um, so we've identified the opportunity, we've identified the partner, and now we're looking at telling the story. And when I was just there in, in April, I went with a, um, a documentary filmmaker. He's a, a former student of David Garrick Ng. He's a, a friend of Cape Breton University. He spent time out here. He's made a fantastic video um, of kind of the resurgence um, and opportunities for, um, for Cape Breton. And he came to South Sudan with us and shot this documentary video. For me, seeing some of those scenes from South Sudan, and it's so nice to see you thinking about telling a story about the research that you do. So often we see people doing research that's hard to understand sometimes for people who aren't doing the work with them. So I'm a little biased because of what I do for a living, but it's really nice to see you putting visuals and letting people tell their stories together. I think it can be really effective. We'll move right along because we do have a lot to get to, yet our next speaker is Yogesh Gore. And Yogesh is a senior member of the program staff at the Cody International Institute at St. Francis Xavier University. He facilitates Cody's educational programs, research initiatives, and capacity strengthening efforts globally in the area of sustainable livelihoods and market systems. Yugesh holds a Master of Public Administration from Columbia University, New York, a postgraduate diploma in forest management from the Indian Institute of Forest Management, a Bachelor of Engineering from India, and he is the recipient of the Ford Foundation's International Fellowship Program. Please welcome Yugesh Gore. Thank you, Akela, and uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks to all the sponsors, including uh, my colleague Pauline uh, from the extension, uh, for bringing me here and, and letting me uh, uh, share some of the experience on, on a couple of uh, social enterprises I am uh, working with in Africa. Uh, but before I begin, David uh, was talking about uh, connections. And I think uh, this particular story that I'm going to share has a very deep connection with CBU and with David because uh, the co-founder of uh, this organization, Farm Shop, was Kevin's uh, old student uh, from Masters, Farooq Jiva, uh, who very closely works uh, with me right now. Uh, we teach uh, courses uh, at Cody together and also overseas. And uh, I have been associated uh, with Farooq ever since uh, uh, he started working on this idea. So it's a pleasure to share this story. I think... Uh, I'll just build on uh, from uh, Kevin's presentation on this uh, whole uh, idea of taking a social uh, enterprise approach to tackling some of the, the biggest challenges in, in, in Africa. Uh, and uh, one of the 
uh, one of the key question that uh, this this particular enterprise answers is how you can uh, how you can uh, I mean we, we all know that social enterprises they try to uh, achieve impact they look at sustainability but one factor that also is important is the scale and what this example tells us that how you can take some of these very innovative solutions to scale uh, so let me begin uh, I will first start by giving a little bit of background about where this uh, social enterprise is that's uh, Kenya, because I think the, the context is really important to understand uh, the kind of work Farm Shop is doing. So 70% uh, of uh, um, Kenyan population is, is dependent on agriculture and livestock for their livelihoods. So we're talking about over 30 million people who are directly dependent on agriculture for their survival. And if you're dependent on agriculture or livestock, farm inputs are very critical uh, for the kind of productivity you will get and also that is a, almost a prerequisite for you to uh, increase your income. So farm inputs are, are very, very critical for those 30 million people who are dependent on agriculture. Now, one of the good things is that there is a, there's a vast network of agro-dealers in Kenya. There are about 10,000 agro-dealers who uh, are the main source where these farmers go to buy their uh, agricultural inputs and, and services and they are also the main source of information uh, for the farmers uh, and and the farmers uh, uh, approach them to buy seeds chemicals fertilizers um, uh, farm equipments uh, animal feed so they are the most important source uh, as far as uh, the inputs are concerned the agro dealers however if we see the the condition of agro dealers and the kind of services they provide uh, there are a lot of challenges there so there you see in the picture there's an empty shelf so these shops exist but they don't normally carry all the inputs that the farmers need. And you also see a picture uh, at the bottom there. It's a typical agro dealer shop uh, in Kenya, for that matter, in many parts of East Africa. Uh, what you see is it's, a, it's, it's like a prison cell. And if you were a farmer, you will go to this uh, shop and first you will just say, okay, I want uh, a bag of maize seed. And first you have to pay the money through that little window and then the shop uh, operator will just like hand over uh, the packet to you. That's it. And, and you're not allowed to go uh, inside the shop, you're not allowed to touch the product, ask questions. Uh, so, and, and because of that, the farmers who are dependent on agriculture where farm inputs are very, very critical, they don't have enough uh, choice, they don't have enough options, they don't have uh, enough opportunities to, 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 to make a decision to go out and, and, and look for products. So because of that, um, although there, there are uh, about 10,000 agro-dealers, they are not uh, actually uh, fully benefiting the smallholder to increase the productivity and increase the income. Uh, so in this context, uh, this social enterprise farm shop uh, started working to just handle these uh, very challenges in terms of providing high quality uh, products and services and information to the smallholder farmers. So what, what exactly they are trying to do? How, how they are trying to uh, change this uh, narrative? So basically the, the way they are trying to uh, achieve scale is through uh, a franchise model, a micro franchise model. Franchise uh, which is very successful in this part of the world. So how you take those successful franchise principles and apply it in, in the context that I just described. So the, 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 the main solution is that you have a franchise network of high quality, well-trained, professionally managed shops. So, so the same shops that we saw will be converted into, uh, into farm shops and they will uh, become access point for the smallholders to go and access these uh, products and services. And uh, so, uh, I'm sure this is a business uh, business school, so we all know about franchising. But just to uh, just to give a gist that in in a franchising model, you have a franchisor and a franchisee, uh, and uh, the franchisor typically uh, uh, owns the trademark, uh, the the trade name, and provides uh, support in terms of financing, advertising, marketing, and also uh, training. And the franchisee actually is the owner of the shop and then uh, he or she expands the business. And uh, the relationship, the, the way it works is that whatever services the franchisor provides, the franchisee pays uh, a fee for that. 
Now the same principles if you apply in case of uh, farm shop, uh, it's, it's the same, same principles but applied in a very uh, micro enterprise uh, context. So if, if you look at this, uh, this diagram, at the very bottom are those smallholder farmers who need uh, good quality inputs and services. And at the very top are all the suppliers uh, of those products and services. So uh, companies who, who manufacture, uh, uh, who, who produce seeds, uh, chemicals, fertilizers, animal feed, uh, they are at the top. So what the farm shop is doing is actually, uh, actually integrating this, uh, this chain where the high quality inputs are provided to the smallholder farmers. So at the very bottom are the smallholder farmers and uh, the stage above it is, is the agro dealers who are converted into a farm shop now. So those agro dealers are farm shop and they are provided high quality inputs, they are, they are provided training through the franchisor which is the, uh, which is the social enterprise farm shop and the main functions same as a, a, a normal franchise, the same functions are there that they, they provide uh, access to finance, they, pr they do the branding marketing, they uh, al also do the training and system development. But one another thing that they do in addition is that they are uh, the owners of the supply chain as well. So basically all the products from those companies uh, are supplied to those small shops by the social enterprise farm shop. So they are basically integrating the entire uh, value chain right from uh, the, the input producers up to the smallholder farmers. So uh, let me show you how these, uh, these shops look. So you saw the shop which looked like a, like a prison cell. And now you, uh, so this, this uh, enterprise started in 2012 and this was the, this is the shop that looked like now. The same shop, it's open. Uh, the farmers can actually go in, uh, they can uh, look at the product, there are different options, they can ask questions to the, uh, to the agro dealer and the, because the agro dealers are, are trained, their capacity is built, they are able to answer those questions of the smallholder farmer. So you see that here there's a, the shop owner is explaining uh, to, the, to the smallholder farmer uh, if there are any questions. They, uh, they have different options to pick from. Uh, and, and they can come and uh, like individually they can discuss in, in groups of farmers and they can also have, if they have questions they can uh, talk to the, uh, to the farm, uh, to the shop operator or, or the shop owner. So in this case, uh, what is important what, uh, when, we would, uh, when we started and we were doing the research, what was important to, to find out that when, when a smallholder farmer goes to a shop, Normally, it's not the shop owner who is at the shop, it's the shop operator who is at the shop. And in almost 90%, we found that it was the women who were the shop uh, operators. So uh, what farm shop learned very quickly is that it's not the training of the owner, it's the training of the operator that was more important. So, they start, they, so, so in their model, uh, training the, the shop operator was a very critical piece. So for in, this uh, in this picture, this, this uh, uh, lady is, is the shop operator. And another piece that, uh, that uh, farm shop does is, is just not about uh, providing uh, quality, access to quality inputs. It's also about uh, knowledge how to use those inputs. So many of those 10,000 agro dealers were, uh, were providing the inputs but they didn't necessarily have the knowledge uh, to transfer uh, uh, it to the farmer so that they can use those inputs uh, correctly. So what farm shop does, they, they, uh, they set up these demonstration plots in the villages uh, and, and, uh, which, and, and the, when the farmers come uh, to the shop, they can actually guide them to these demonstration plots so that they can, uh, farmers can go and learn from them. And the, some of the critical inputs in terms of products, so the, the, these shops actually do three things. They, they provide inputs, they provide services, and they provide information. So in terms of products, these are the very like basic products that any farmer needs. So seeds, fertilizers, agrochemicals, veterinary medicine, animal feed, uh, and all like, because uh, these smallholder farmers are not uh, producing just one crop, they are producing multiple crops. Uh, so therefore, the, the requirement of the products is also uh, diversified. They provide different services, 
and this is the critical part uh, which differentiates a farm shop from any other agro dealer is that the products and services are combined with the with the information and advice that the shops provide to the farmers now so as as i said that uh, these farmers are, are are not one monocrop farmers because uh, they are small uh, they have a small plot of land they have to diversify their uh, livelihood uh, portfolio so they will uh, grow uh, some maize they will grow some vegetables they will have uh, a cow maybe uh, they will have a, a a pig so that uh, there is uh, they can they can cope up with the risk that is associated with farming so if you have um, a requirement like this where the the farmer requires different diversified kind of products then you have to offer those kind of uh, services as well so in in a typical uh, farming cycle farmers need continuous uh, farmers continuously need feed for animal uh, because uh, they have to feed them so that they can uh, give milk uh, they need uh, continuous um, supply of uh, uh, vaccination for those uh, animals but in in uh, in small parks they need uh, uh, seed whenever they need uh, whenever there is a agriculture seed done so these spikes are uh, when they need the the seeds for for crops and then followed by uh, the the pesticides and and, and chemicals uh, it's been 3 years uh, this model uh, um, has been uh, um, uh, started and uh, the results are uh, are amazing uh, I, I visit uh, uh, the project every year and some of the shops who started like uh, who were earning revenues of four to five hundred dollars uh, per month after becoming farm shop in a period of two months uh, they they break even and uh, on an average their increase in revenue is 500 percent within in just two months and and there are some shops where which started at uh, 600 dollars per month revenue and uh, they were in location where there was a lot of demand especially for the animal input their um, their revenues have increased by 4000 percent 4000 percent and i have personally met some of these uh, agro dealers in kenya and because uh, a lot of population is dependent on agriculture, this demand is, is, is growing. So right now, um, the last I was talking to, uh, to Farooq, there are uh, 45 shops uh, up and running. And uh, all of these shops at the, at the agro dealer level, so we are talking about these, these micro enterprises converted into a franchise uh, uh, form. Uh, all of them after two months uh, are uh, making profit but the franchisor is not profitable at the moment and i will uh, i will tell you when they will be profit, uh, profitable but uh, uh, it, it tells you that for the model to be uh, to be successful both the franchisee the agro dealer and the franchisor has to be uh, profitable so what are uh, some of the uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's still early days. These are uh, lessons learned thus, thus far. Um, and, and because uh, we have been tracking their progress since, uh, since the, the beginning, that these are some of the preliminary lessons, is that uh, inputs are a very critical gap in, in, uh, in rural development, particularly in, in context of Africa. The second thing that we learned is that uh, whatever product or service uh, that, uh, that the enterprise provides, uh, and specifically social enterprise in, in any context has to build a trust of uh, trust of the people especially in a context uh, in an emerging market context where the legal system is not so reliable for you to fall back on so that's uh, therefore your product or service that you are providing has to has to create enough trust with with your uh, customers in, in this in this case the farmers so it's, it's very important to build that trust uh, and that is what uh, farm shop is, is, is real, realizing now that each shop has to build a trust along with that farm shop name. The second thing uh, that, that we are learning is that, uh, so the first shop that was started uh, in two, um, uh, 2012 was closed down I think in, in six months. 
the first four shops started, uh, three of them closed down in, in first year. So what Farm Shop quickly learned was that whatever concepts you have, you just start with them. Don't try to make a perfect model and, 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 and start with 20 shops. So they started small, they learned things, and then they changed, they adopted the model. And now, with that learning, there are 40 shops, and the iteration has gone down. So not, not when, once the shop is converted into farm shop, they continue. They don't drop out now. So another learning is that whatever, uh, whatever thing, and, and then this, this applies to, I, I think, uh, social enterprises in general, that whatever idea you have, it's a good idea to, to develop a prototype and just pilot it quickly. Uh, pilot quickly and, and maybe fail quickly, learn from it and, and adopt. The, another thing why a uh, uh, lot of the, when FarmShop start, uh, started and, and we started interacting with, with the agro dealers and also when, when I personally go there as a researcher, uh, I go and talk to other agro dealers as well. And, and one of the questions we always had was that how FarmShop is going to compete uh, with the uh, other agro dealers, I mean, uh, they still have to because they are providing good quality products and service, their costs would be high, and and that's the, that's the case. Uh, but what we what we found over and especially now is that the integrated nature of service that the farm shop provides is just not about the products; it's about the services, it's it's about the advice that they get, which the other shops are not able to provide, and the farmers actually value that. And last is that. Uh, the, the capacity building or the knowledge transfer uh, of the of the agro dealer as well as of the uh, of knowledge being transferred to the farmer is very very critical so this capacity building is is ongoing sorry this is the last so as i said right now there are about 45 shops up and running shops are profitable at the micro enterprise level but the farm shop the franchisor is not profitable at the, uh, right now. And, and, and uh, when we talk about social enterprises registering as non-for-profit or for-profit, Farm Shop actually started as a non-for-profit. So a lot of their initial work of, of piloting, testing, was done through grant support. And they, uh, they continue to rely on that grant uh, for, for, for some time. And I think as per their calculation now, they will reach a break point of, uh, uh, in about 120 shops. So when they reach out to 120 shops, they, the model will become uh, self-sustaining. Uh, it means the, the, the market uh, will take care of uh, it. And, and the, the more shops they open, uh, the more profitable the model will become. All right, so that was the experience from uh, Kenya. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. It's great to see you having that kind of success in Kenya. I'll pick up on this connections theme that David has started us off on here this morning, which Yogesh and I have realized just as we were chatting this morning. I must admit, I didn't know very much about the Cody Institute before I went to South Sudan. And while I was there, I actually did a feature story on one of Cody's graduates who is from South Sudan and has returned and has experienced tremendous success and credits all of his success to the Cody Institute in Little Anaganish, Nova Scotia, so it was very uh, nice for me to see that. And now as a result, I've made a connection with Cody and Yogesh and I will be uh, at another event together in October. So we are, we are certainly making lots of connections here and it's great to see that. Our next speaker is Netta Foray and she is a health psychologist and adjunct professor at Carleton University and a visiting scholar at the Center for Refugee Studies at York University. At McGill University, she is the program coordinator for the Multicultural Mental Health Resource Center associated with the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry. Netta established the first virtual psychology clinic in Chad. Her work involves training community health workers in mental health delivery. I know you'll be very interested to hear her speak more about that. Please welcome Netta. Thank you, Kayla. The way you say it, it sounds so much more important and so much nicer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So just to bring the stories together, my story with this work is a personal story. I lived in Chad for several years. My formative years um, were spent there. I am also a former refugee arriving in Canada some 30 years ago. So this is really the connection of my work um, with refugees and in particular in Chad. This is a poem that is inscribed uh, by the Statue of Liberty. Um, this is certainly the image that we often get when we, thought, when we think about refugees, the tired, the poor, the huddled masses. Um, I'll show you another image, which has really not much to do with that beautiful poem, but also a reality of, of being a refugee or wanting to be a refugee. Often we think of refugee with a little bit of pity but being a refugee is actually a privilege. Um, you have to be really lucky to earn that status. Um, and there are millions and millions who do not. Um, I was a very, very lucky one who was able to, to get that. So who is not a refugee? Well, most people who are in distress and outside of their state are actually not refugees. So categorization is a very, very important um, fact. So here you have Somali refugees um, in Kenya, and in the other one, you have a very different type of uh, refugee living arrangement in Georgia. It's not a new concept. It has existed long before the 1951 convention. Uh, the convention was written so that we could help, or the UNHCR eventually, could help um, refugees in crisis. What we have right now are 35 million refugees. That is the official count, which is a total underestimation of the actual numbers. Um, but the system that we have right now helps people in crisis, and most people are in protracted refugee situations. Um, so talking a little bit, I, I, I will come back to it, talking a little bit about citizenship versus refugee, uh, refugeehood, being a refugee, is really a birthright lottery where you're born um, and what are the systems in place, what are the rules, who is friends with whom and who is enemies with whom, who is doing war with whom, and at what time exactly in history are you becoming a refugee. So if I were to be um, a stateless person in Chad as I was many, many years ago, if I were to be that today, I would not be considered a refugee. But at the time I was. So again, the luck of the draw. So it's a little bit problematic and I want to talk about that very briefly because it really affects what we can do with the refugees in a refugee camp. So, and also because of the protracted refugee problem, there are many, many people who are born to refugees who are in no man's land. So quickly, this is Chad, landlocked um, near Sudan. I will talk to you about a particular two particular refugee camps um, in what is considered northern Chad, Desert Darfur, refugees who have been in the Gereda region for at least 15 years. Um, there are, the area has about uh, a population of 43,000 uh, people, 40,000 of them are refugees, protracted refugees. A um, little bit closer just to see, it's really dry, so Abishé is pretty much the northern city that you can go. Th these refugee camps that I'm talking about are slightly further north, um, 48 residents. So the dots that you see, the reds and the greens, these are the actual camps. Um, an interesting distinction is that the red ones are called refugee camps and the green ones are called IDPs, internally displaced. It is interesting that they are not put together. So the refugees, it's the same people, but depending on which side of, um, of the line you're coming from, you're going to be treated very differently. Um, just getting to my notes. <coughs> A 
I'd just like to make some comments about the, th the theories around um, when, we, when we look at refugee studies. There are many conceptual confusions about what a refugee is, who is a refugee. There are many, many synonyms. So you have the displaced, you have the asylum seekers, you have the stateless. Um, a lot of the time we hear these um, terms interchangeably in the media. We also have the economic migrants. Uh, we have illegal immigrants. We have um, uh, what's called even a bogus asylum seeker and the de facto uh, refugee. The de facto refugee is the one who gets lucky enough to have a blue identification paper from the UNHCR. Um, and these make a difference in terms of how you bring in the help um, if you want to work with a refugee camp. Um, the refugee is, um, the de facto refugee stands outside of um, many sorts of protection that would be provided under human rights. They no longer have their sovereign protection from their country of origin. They have no protection from the host community quite often. There is land that is leased by the UNHCR and they live in that area. And some of the rules that are put together to protect them to begin with, such as keeping them together, are also the rules that are not um, allowing help to get in. So a lot of the time, refugees are not allowed to leave the camp. So they're, they're, they're very much encamped. Um, the worst scenario of that is, of course, in Australia, or off the island, where um, the refugee uh, camp is actually run as a prison by a corporation, and they can't get off um, the island. So the context is uh, within most refugee camps, but specifically in Guerrera, um, is the people who've come to the refugee camps, of course they have their own mental health issues, which would be like any, anywhere else, but then the, once they get to the refugee camps, now they have new mental health issues. Um, and it's really difficult to get to these camps, more than anything else. Um, even if we could get into the camps, how do we help them? And who am I as a psychologist from Canada to go in there and diagnose mental illness? Because as we know, mental illness is very much determined by culture and context. Um, and so even if we could get in there and we had everything that's required, we can't really do that work. We really need the people themselves to do that. But how do we train them? And in order to, one of the best ways to improve mental health anywhere um, is to give people a sense of agency and self-determination. And that is what is taken away um, from the refugee. They're not allowed to own land. They're not allowed to make decisions for themselves. Um, they're not allowed to work. And this is where social enterprise comes in. And I'm really here to learn from all of you because this is not my background. And I would love to hear your ideas. Um, and. I'm definitely eagerly awaiting the results coming out of South Sudan to see how the community of the health workers and the social enterprise um, are coming along and how we could use the results and what they, they learn in the Gareda camps. So people in the camps, uh, when they arrive, they have witnessed war. Um, there's, of course, a lot of trauma and some versions and variations of post-traumatic stress disorder. Often there is separation from families. There's a lot of anxiety and isolation um, and chronic stress. And as we know, anxiety and especially chronic stress is really the bread and butter of psychologists. This is what we work with all the time. Uh, chronic stress will make you sick. Um, and this is what's happening in, in any refugee situation, a protracted refugee situation. Um, there's a lot of stigma around mental health, any kind of health but especially mental health. So getting mental health help into the camps is very difficult because if you go and you provide the help, then you have stigmatized um, the person who's received the help. In order to help them, in order to bring, to provide help and tools so that people can help themselves, one of the best ways is to allow them to work. And so one idea is to see, well, can we uh, bring some sort of some form of cooperative where we can get around the laws that govern the refugee camp, such as no working and no access to money and no ownership. Can we somehow get around these through social enterprise and through the use of cooperatives? 
um, to get around the formal, you know, the fact that there's no formal economy, there's no sovereign protection, there's no ownership, um, and very limited resources. How can we get around that? Um, there's also environmental insecurity and there's food insecurity, and the connection between food insecurity and, and mental health is often around gender-based violence. The women are responsible for feeding their families. They must leave the camp environment to go out and gather wood, and in that process, they're often attacked. Um, one of the, and then there's stigma, of course, attached around that. So what is happening is that families are not trying to get their daughters married off early before a rape or a pregnancy occurs. So now we have to be really introducing new problems, and on and on it goes. Um, so this is one of the areas that we're looking at as well, specifically around gender safety. And is there a way, can we, can we um, help gender safety if we help with food security? And what are the ways around that? Um, in terms of mental health and what is available, so uh, there are, um, the area hospitals are quite strained. Um, there are, they see 500 patients per week uh, per hospital, so we're talking about 40, I would say 48,000 residents, so the uh, refugees and the residents are receiving the same services, including food that is delivered by the World Food Program. Mental health, um, so we talk about depression, psychosis, and various, you know, various forms of psychosis and schizophrenia in particular, but epilepsy is also considered by the World Health Organization a form of mental health issue and it is put together and it's a common problem especially because of malaria uh, the hospitals don't have inpatient facilities there's no referring possibilities so if whoever is attending cannot help the person this is it there's nowhere to go um, and there are no community resources so the mentally ill are often chained um, they're considered a danger and quite bad for the family because um, of the animist culture uh, the psychotropics and medication is also very limited, uh, especially injectables in case of psychosis and schizophrenia. What you want to do is to inject people so that we don't have to rely on them taking, um, taking the pills. So this is me going there and talking to people who are doing health work and say, okay, what kind of help do you need in order to assess the mental health problems of the population that you see? So let's look at what you're seeing today and what are, the, what are your needs. Um, the context and culture, is very similar in, in, you know, in that area with the Sub-Saharan Africa. You have genital mutilation that's still happening, you have electomy, removal of milk teeth. So these are, these are things that are adding to the health problems, existing uh, problem, conjugal violence, family conflict. Women prefer husbands over children because of the problem with food security. They can always have another child, they can't always get another husband. Um, there's a caste system, there's different social standings, and the problems that people had in Darfur that are causing, causing the, you know, whatever the situation is over there that is causing the problems, we well, use the same people. So when they come to the camps, they have the same problems. So, so the camps are not necessarily, well, well, they're camps, but, but what, what I'm trying to say is that the problems come with them, the social problems that, that were there are also now represented again within the camps. Um, stigma, as I said, is a big problem because of H, uh, HIV. People don't want to be, you know, je ne suis pas fou, I'm not crazy, this is a big one. Um, so uh, community health workers have a very hard time actually making house visits. Um, Another problem is with the unemployed males. Women tend to keep busy, the men don't, and it causes often um, a lot of mental health issues. Um, decreasing food rations, the WH, uh, sorry, the, wo the World Food Program as a way of trying to make people more self-reliant um, has had the brilliant idea of decreasing the number of calories that people get, um, hoping that this would make them more likely to try and become self-reliant. What has happened is that the women have to now go out more often, and so now you have more gender-based violence and rape that are occurring. And the budget, of course, um, the food budget and various food budgets are, are, are decreasing. Um, 
So the UN and the WHO agree that refugees suffer from chronic psychosocial distress. So that is, we are learning more and more about it as um, researchers are getting into the camps and doing studies. Um, they're very challenging environments and delivering mental health and any kind of health service is incredibly difficult. And even if we could do it from here, we're really imposing and, and we have to really worry about uh, bringing another neo-colonial system um, over there with our ways of uh, looking at mental health problems. So what can be done? Uh, can we use established models? Can we start with what is already there um, to see if we can put them all together and look at some of the evidence-based? So some of the established um, approaches are various forms of economic organization. So can we, do, can we bring a social enterprise and can, can we bring a cooperative? So one idea is to have, since they cannot work, but they can, or rather they can work, but they're not supposed to be paid for it. So we can have them to volunteer and then somehow find a way such as, you know, matching funds to, to, to provide money uh, for the work that they're doing. Um, the good thing about social enterprise and a, and a cooperative is that there are models, existing models that can be used, there are voluntary membership, they're jointly owned. So even though we have no ownership, we're really trying to get around that. Um, and we can bring social cohesion, or that's the idea, uh, through you know, a lot more cooperation, especially between um, the refugees and the host communities, and bring back some form of human agency, bring back some form of self-determination. So training of non-specialists, uh, that has been done, I'm involved with uh, um, a project in Nigeria that is helping, that is training community health workers to provide mental health, it is successful. Um, it has its issues like everything else, but that seems to be really one good way of going about it. Um, and it can be uh, supported virtually. As Kayla said, I run, an, um, I run a clinic virtually in Chad. Uh, the country has no psychologist. It has one psychiatrist who's actually quite ill and not working. So really, there's absolutely nothing. It's, it's, you know, it's not a void because you have um, you have various forms of mental health through um, traditional healers, but actual psychological help and clinical help is not available. So I started this, um, this Skype clinic that has had some success and a lot of demand, quite limited in what it can offer, but the idea is to just have more people um, oh. trained so that can be done locally. So can we use the same idea uh, over there? We know that Médecins Sans um, Doctors Without Borders have used this system in Somalia and it has been successful. So the training needs for the women who would become community work, uh, health workers would be basically around capacity building. Can they, can they do diagnosis? Can they do intervention? Uh, can they provide patient support? So these are the ideas that we need to do really an ethnographic study and decide which are the particular ones that we want to address. And it seems that the ones that are really important right now would be psychosis, some form of psychosis, which is common, um, and epilepsy. Um, and then teaching, teaching the community to care for itself um, and reintegrate the mentally ill. So we're trying to combine various expertise um, from different approaches and, and see if we can build a cohesive model that could work within um, the limits that we have that are very particular to, to the refugee camps. So the objectives would be to provide gender safety, um, establish some sort of informal economy and autonomy, um, decrease hours of physical labors. So, in the abstract, I talk about um, solar kitchen, for example. These are some ideas that have been tried out in the past. Can we bring solar kitchen, some kind of a community kitchen? What that does is that it, it prevents women from having to go out to gather wood, and that would decrease um, the number of rapes that are happening. That has been tried in sub-Saharan Africa. Women don't particularly like solar kitchens, but where they are being used, um, they have been successful, and gender safety has improved. Um, 
so now if we could do that, if we could, if we could allow women not to go, we get about four extra hours per day. So they now have four extra hours that can be used to train them and for them to work as volunteers. Um, so social enterprise and food technology bringing it um, together. And this is our proposed methodology. How am I doing with time? Okay. Okay, so we want to start with participatory research where we go in there and we ask people to teach us about what their needs are and what their issues are. Uh, identifying key partners who are working there. In the case of refugee camps, there would be um, NGOs who are on the ground doing some sort of preliminary analysis, situational analysis, and adapt the project that we want, that we're proposing accordingly. And then in phase two, to go in and actually implement the project and follow with monitoring and evaluation. Thank you.